We're going to get to it with our next guest on what that latest data, alongside recent pressure in some of the big tech names, means for markets. Joining us now to discuss, we've got Sarah Malik, Nuveen, Chief Investment Officer, here with us on our stools. Thank you so much for coming in, Sarah. Thanks we appreciate it. Uh, that consumer confidence data doesn't seem like it's going to be a huge catalyst for the market today. So I want to dive in on the tech story. We're seeing NVIDIA turning around a little bit here. What are the movements that you're seeing in NVIDIA and even Bitcoin tell you about this market rally right now? What's the broader thesis you can drive from it? The recent moves in NVIDIA and Bitcoin are telling us that investors are becoming a little bit more cautious under the surface. I think there are cracks in the economy that we need to be concerned about, from weaker consumer data to employment markets that are starting to show signs of weakness. Uh, NVIDIA, though, bigger picture. It's just back to its early June levels. Uh, if you look at it versus the semiconductor index, it's actually not an expensive stock. It trades at a discount to the index. So longer term, I think the AI trend is still in place. It's going to increase productivity for companies. But if, as of last week, tech was looking overbought. The amount of flows that had gone into the sector, uh, you know, the, the market had been up eight out of nine days in a row. Uh, it's, it's time for a healthy bit of a sell-off in that area. But I think longer term, the fundamental drivers of NVIDIA and AI are still intact. So then should this be viewed as a buying opportunity, some of this recent weakness? Well, it's hard to tell in these short short-term swings in stock prices of where you would catch the bottom. Are you catching a falling knife? Are you really hitting the bottom here? You know, we can watch technicals to try to figure it out. That's a bit tough. I think the catalyst for tech will be second quarter earnings, though, in a few weeks. If NVIDIA can continue to beat that hurdle, beat the bar for earnings, I think the stock will recover. Until you get to their earnings number, though, is there a lot to say where's the bottom in NVIDIA? That's tough because that's trading on momentum and investor flows right now. So last question I'll have for you on NVIDIA, at least. What settles this stock, right? What would be the catalyst to put it in a range that's a little bit more based on the fundamentals, based a little bit less on, you know, seasonality and trends like the fact that we're heading towards the end of the month? What will cause the stock to just settle a little bit here? What's been the driver for mega cap tech earnings has been for, has been quarterly earnings. If you look at first quarter earnings, tech drove earnings. So we need to get to those earnings numbers. You saw that last quarter with Meta, which put up very strong numbers. Even Apple starting to settle on earnings was the beginning of the rally for Apple. NVIDIA, same thing. We need them to keep beating and raising, and people will then say, okay, this stock is worth more than where it's trading today. Until then, I think it can remain more in a trading range or even as soft because it's just trading on people's momentum and flows in and out of the tech sector. Sarah, going back to what you just said a moment ago when you talked about some of the cracks that are starting to form within the economy, talk to us just about what exactly the signal or what signals that sends to investors right now or maybe what investors need to keep in mind given some of the risk associated with that. So two areas we're starting to become concerned about, that's the consumer and the jobs market. So first with the consumer, we've seen it in weaker retail sales data, fast food discounting, even retailer foot traffic starting to slow. Employment numbers have been mixed, so payrolls have been very strong, but if you look at unemployment claims, they're almost at cycle highs. I think consumer and employment goes together when you feel secure in your job, you tend to spend more. We're seeing both of those start to break down. My view is that a recession is a when, not an if at this point. Are we at a recession today? Are we slowly? No, but we're slowly approaching one. And maybe fourth quarter of this year, first quarter of 2025, we will probably be in that recession. I was going to say, so what exactly is going to be the catalyst? Because I, th I think so many people have been a little bit surprised or very surprised, quite frankly, just about the resilience here of the consumer. And even though we are starting to see some weakening, it doesn't seem to be drastic, I guess, up until this point. So what is going to change some of that? Diana? Sure, the resilience of this economy in the face of higher interest rates and inflation has been surprising. Many investors thought 2023 would be the year of the recession. But now we're starting to see what needs to break down. The employment markets are the main catalysts that need to break down. And it, they're still reasonably healthy. And then the consumers needs to slow. I think consumers showing more signs of slowing than the employment markets. And that slow decline will be eventually what takes us into that recession. Now, of course, many hope that the Fed will cut rates in time to save us. I think the Fed will eventually start cutting rates, but I don't think it'll be enough for us to just stave off any form of a recession. Does that indicate to you that the Fed is already too late? Well, I think it's tough for the Fed because they're in a tough spot. They want to maintain their credibility by not cutting too early. They've been clear they will not cut interest rates until inflation shows signs of moderating and approaching their target. Just last month's inflation numbers were the first ones that were coming in under consensus. We need multiple data points before they can cut. Inflation was just reaccelerating earlier this year. So if the Fed cuts too early and causes reacceleration of inflation, we have another problem. So that's a balance for them. They need to cut in time to save off, try to minimize the impact of a recession, but also make sure 
they don't cause inflation to pick up again. You know, I'm curious what you make of the inflation trend that we have seen, because uh, Treasury Secretary uh, Jenny Yellen was on with Jennifer Schaumburg on Yahoo Finance yesterday, saying that she remains confident that we're going to get to that 2% target next year. Is that realistic, or I guess how much, how does the Fed then balance what you're talking about, the, the tough spot that they've been put in, they don't want to cut too early, and, and and risk reigniting that inflation rate versus seeing enough progress but not waiting too late. Sure, and I don't think we'll hit 2% inflation in 2024. We do have a chance of getting there next year. It's going to depend on some of these areas like autos, which have been inflationary, healthcare insurance. Also in the PCE number this week, we'll see financial services, which will likely remain strong in, within inflation because of the market rally, which tends to inflate that number. So the Fed has to balance that, but also what's the economy doing? So you could see them start to cut before we hit 2% if the economy weakens enough, and that's going to be their balance you know, how, what is the economy doing versus what is inflation doing? What are the risks of cutting and reaccelerating inflation versus the risks of not cutting and causing a deep recession? Is a recession a requirement for 2%? I don't think it has to be a requirement, but I think it's most likely. I think the consensus view that somehow we get through this period of high rates, high inflation, and we just have this beautiful soft landing is kind of a tough one. The markets are pricing that in. That's where I think the challenge is. You're going into the second half of this year. While Q2 earnings should be strong, we do have to worry about volatility around the elections and the slowing in the economy. It's going to be a tougher second half than the first half. Since you mentioned the election, we've got the debate coming up on Thursday. I want to get a sense from you how much you think that could be a driver of the market's ability to price in what the outcome could potentially be on November 5th. Do you think the events like the upcoming debate are going to impact the market's view? I don't think a specific debate will impact the market's view as much as what are earnings doing for the second quarter? What is the next economic and inflationary data point? You know, markets don't like uncertainty. What is certain is we do generally know who our two candidates should be. Um, in, a, in an election year, good news and bad news. Good news is markets tend to go up about 11 percent. We've already experienced that good news. Bad news is volatility tends to go up, too. That's what I expect to happen in the second half of the year. And remember, this isn't just a U.S. election year. There are 77 countries going to the polls this year. That's 60 percent of GDP. So this will be a global volatility event, and we're already seeing that in places like South Africa, India, France, and all these other areas of the world that are already experiencing elections and seeing some volatility. But just one debate later this week, I think that's going to have less of an impact than PCE will on Friday. Sarah Malik, great to have you here, especially in studio. Thanks so much for taking the time to Thanks. join us here at the top of the show. Nuveen, it's a Chief Investment Officer. Thanks so much, Sarah. Thank you.